So we have a million things to talk about with you and a whole bunch of different categories. But one of them we'll start out with because we came on so strong. Let's not start there anyways. Let's talk about honesty because honesty is a big part of some of the stuff you talk about. And I think for us as women and for many of the women we work with, they really struggle with honesty in their marriages and relationships. And for damn good reason. Uh, because when you are honest, uh, three quarters of the time it doesn't go very well and you're not stupid, right? Yeah. So uh, it's all well and good to say, you know, I, I, um, uh, I have a thing I call fierce intimacy. I believe in fierce intimacy. I believe that what happens to many couples is they stop taking each other on, resentment grows, generosity and sexuality dies, and there you are. Then they're coming to someone like us. And uh, taking each other on and dealing with the issues as they come up in real time, you know, that's just hygiene. That's just like brushing your teeth or going to the doctor. It's what you need to do to keep the relationship clean and straight. We don't do it. We don't do it because, A, women are socialized to believe that asserting yourself is mean. B, women are socialized to believe, and feminism has helped, but it's not perfect, uh, that your needs are, should be, a good woman shouldn't really care that much about her needs. She should be at the service of those who she loves. And most important, uh, women know that when you confront men, all hell breaks loose, <laughs> and they're too smart to do it. So I talk to women about what I call, uh, now look, I can't, if you're married to a beast who's going to get defensive and <clears throat> retaliatory uh, every time you bring up an issue, uh, I, uh, you know, get drag that guy into couples therapy. You're in over your head. And, and let me just say this. People ask me, when do I n n know when to I need help? The answer is when you can't handle it alone. Duh. It's like, when do I need help fixing my tire? Well, when you can't fix it, then you ask for help. <laughs> Uh, so that's that. But let's, here's the thing. I, I can't uh, teach you how to control the outcome of the other person, but I can teach you how to be as skillful as possible and optimize the possibility of being actually listened to. Here's how you speak with love. Assertion with love. Now, we don't do that. No. We don't do that. No. Under, under patriarchy, if I can say this, you can either be uh, connected or you can be powerful. But under patriarchy, you can't be both at the same time because power is power over, not power with. It's dominance. And so once you move into power, you break connection. What women are afraid of in speaking up to men is that the men will blow up and get angry or they'll run away and withdraw and shut down, leave you. Somebody can run away and still be sitting there. It's called uh, stonewalling somebody. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, this is particularly interesting, the guy will fall apart and it will be your fault because you confronted him. You will have unmasked him. You will have shamed him. These are the things that uh, frighten women to speak up to men. And by the way, these are the same things that frighten therapists to speak up to men. <laughs> and indeed, our patients, when confronted, can either blow up, walk out, or fall apart, and you'll feel guilty. It's the same force of patriarchy that is stopping women from speaking and stopping therapists from speaking. Mm. So how do you do it? Uh, under patriarchy, you can be a connected, affiliative female quote unquote, or you can be powerful, independent, assertive male, quote unquote, but you can't be both. Leading men and women and non-binary folks, leading everybody into true intimacy is synonymous with moving them beyond patriarchy because patriarchy doesn't allow intimacy. It's not built for intimacy. So what do I mean? It goes like this. Uh, Jen, uh, I need to clear the air with you. This is a role play, of course. I, <laughs> I, need to clear the air. I need to clear the air with you. Is this an okay time? Yes. Okay. 
first you negotiate clearing the air. You don't just walk in and core dump. Mm -hmm. uh, once Jen says yes, and Jen's a stand in for the husband, I'm the wife, you're the husband. Mm -hmm. Once Jen says yes, that protects me from turning her turning around at the end of it and going, well, that was really no, 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 no. You agree to it, hon. remember? Mm -hmm. So that protects me. It's called a contract. Good couples live and breathe contracts. Contracts protect the person who's making the contract. OK, it's a good time. Great. Let me say something to you. I am so happy we're married. I think you are just the greatest thing. And even your willingness to sit and listen to me right now is a wonderful thing. And so in keeping with who you are at your best. I appreciate that. Who sounds like that? Now, having said that, Jen, let me tell you, when you put your foot on my neck in the waiting room, uh, I felt really shitty. It felt really dominant and and like not very respectful. Uh, it, it, could you do me a favor and uh, deal with that and maybe reassure me that you're going to stop doing that? That's what assertion with love sounds like. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, first, I want to say that like your approach to that is is so incredible because you are, you know, when you're going to your partner and you're saying to them, I love you, I'm here for you, but I don't want to tolerate this in our relationship. I think the tough thing that happens is that, you know, when we're in the thick of it, couples are very reactive to each other and in order yeah. to do that it it it's necessary to take yourself out of reaction that's exactly right and that is the very first skill that i teach everybody and it's the core skill in relational life therapy and relational living which is the method i've created is what i call relational mindfulness and it goes like this as a therapist, as I'm talking to you, the most important question I'm asking myself is not, let's say you, you two are a couple. I'm not saying, what are the external stressors? I'm interested, but that's not the most important question. A good couple can handle stress. And I'm not even uh, most important uh, thinking about the choreography between the two of you, the dance, dance, dance. That's very important too, you know, uh, the more Emily pursues, the more Jen distances, and the more Jen distances, the more Emily pursues. That's the ongoing choreography that keeps repeating. Very important. Not the most important. The most important question is this one. Which part of you am I talking to? Mm -hmm. Am I talking to what I call the wise adult part of you? Prefrontal cortex of the brain the most mature, developed part of the brain, thoughtful, deliberate, intentional? Or am I talking to an immature part of you? Either your very, very young wounded child, which is the limbic system, or your adaptive child. And let me say something about the adaptive child part of you. This is what you learn to do as a kid to get by. Maybe you're a caretaker. Maybe you're in your room, you know, with the pillow over your head because your parents are screaming and you want to get away. Maybe, 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 maybe you're a distancer. Maybe you're a this or maybe you're a that or. That is your adaptation. Now, it would be great if folks uh, listening could take a moment and think about what is my most go to stance? Am I a distancer? Am I a pursuer? Am I aggressive? Am I, am I one down? Am I one up? What do I like? What do I do in relationships over and over again? The next question is, where did you learn that from? Hmm. Because uh, I teach, uh, as you may know, uh, I teach all of my trainees to always be respectful of the exquisite intelligence of that adaptive child part of you. Mm -hmm. You did back then brilliantly exactly what you needed to do to preserve your wholeness and integrity. But I have a saying, adaptive then, maladaptive now. You're not that little girl, Emily, 
She is not your mother. Jen has resources like understanding, kindness, whatever that you're, again, more role play that your mother didn't <laughs> have. And you have resources uh, that that little girl didn't have. So bring yourself out of the triggered parts of your brain, subcortical limbic system, into your prefrontal cortex, out of these immature parts of you, back into the centered adult. And I'm a big fan of breaks. Uh, 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 agree to this up front. Uh, have a signal, pineapple. Pineapple means I'm going to lose my shit. I'm, I'll be back in 20 minutes. Now, you have to say how long you're going to take, and you have to come back. It's a break. It's not a rupture. If you don't do that, your partner will get stimulated and anxious and they'll start coming after you. But if you really want to be left alone, take good care of them. I'm taking a break. Here's why. Here's when I come back. And then you go somewhere and have a little chat with yourself. And that chat sounds something like this. What the fuck am I about right now? What do I want? What am I really about? And be honest with yourself. Am I really about trying to make things better between my, me and my partner right now? Or am I about proving I'm right, getting them, controlling them, retaliating and making them hurt, or uh, ventilating till the cows come home? These are losing strategies. If you are involved with any of those losing strategies, you are not in your wise adult. Keep talking to yourself. You know you're ready to come back, and the very first skill, the most important skill, is what I call remembering love. Mm -hmm. Keeping your wits about you, remembering what you're about. Somebody said, wait, why am I talking? And remembering love means the person I'm speaking to is someone I love, and the reason why I'm speaking is to make things better between us. If you are in that place, go ahead and talk. If you're not in that place, I have great advice for you. You want to know what it is? <laughs> Shut up. Okay. I think that the most important part of making repair with each other when the wheels come off is getting into a place where you want to make repair to begin with. Mm. Once you're there, the skills will follow. Uh, but if you're not there, Tone trumps content because tone tells you where you really are. I, I say to my wife, Belinda, hey, Belinda, I want to clear the air with you. <laughs> Is this a good time? And Belinda goes, uh, no. <laughs> well, first and first, let me say I love that you say that because, you know, we always talk about how, you know, we do couples therapy and obviously, you know, you're uh, – just a beacon of doing couples therapy and Thank but you. that it's still in your relationship like it still comes up and it's it's important to kind of look at it in your own relationship too and say well how can I utilize these skills and it sounds like it it plays out between the two of you you and your wife every RLT therapist walks to the talk mm. um it, 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 Let's take self-esteem, for example. That's an, another big thing in, in, our, in relational life work. Um, first of all, I, I, I wrote this. I wrote a new book, which I, you guys got to come uh, invite me back in March and we'll talk. Deal. About oh, oh, my no, gosh. Please. <laughs> the book is called Us. Us Getting Past You and Me to Build a More Loving Relationship. Mm. And it's about moving beyond that win-lose, adversarial, we're enemies, and r relational mindfulness. Waking up to remember that you're a team and that it's in your interest to do well with each other. It's in your interest to make peace with your partner. Happy spouse, happy house, as they say. Mm. I would love to hear about um, one of the things I think you talk very um, specifically about, and I think is so insanely helpful. And I know it's been helpful because it was one of the things that changed my husband's life is men in vulnerability and men in their emotions. My yeah. husband was from a family that did not talk about feelings and men sure as hell did not talk about feelings. 
And there is such a lack of intimacy when men have been had this stripped away from them, right? When we talk about how damaging the patriarchy has been, a lot of it is that men have lost out on this amazing intimacy in so many ways. And so what do you think? How do we encourage our husbands, our boyfriends, our partners, our fathers that it is okay to be vulnerable when so many of them have been taught that it's not? You know, the first thing I want you to uh, be is compassionate. Mm. Uh, this is breaking the rules. And a vulnerable man is regard, you know how women talk about the male gaze? Well, mm -hmm. men also are subject to the male gaze. My friend Jack Sternbach said, every man is surrounded by a crowd that's judging his every move. Thumbs mm -hmm. up, thumbs down. You're a real man, you're a wimp. Every man walks around with that. And the essence, uh, this is what my new book's about, the essence of masculinity uh, is invulnerability. The more invulnerable you are, the more manly you are, the more vulnerable you are, the more unmanly you are. And think about boys' heroes. They're all superheroes. They have no vulnerability at all. So when you ask a man to be emotionally vulnerable, which, by the way, women all over the West are now asking for, <laughs> understand that it's a brand new demand on these guys and understand that it flies it's the opposite of what they were taught men are taught to hold vulnerability in contempt and this is really redoing reconfiguring the whole goddamn system that we were raised in so have a little respect and patience for what these guys are up against having said that hold the bar high mm. for your husbands and for your sons hold the bar high uh you can't do this as a partner but i'll tell you as a therapist uh routinely i have a little exercise with men who don't feel i'll say uh bob uh, take out a piece of paper and a pencil those of you listening can do this now and i want you to write seven words in a column one word under the other under the other and the other okay you ready bob these are core feelings joy pain anger fear shame guilt love joy pain anger fear shame guilt love uh, I inherited these from one of my great mentors, Pia Melody. And uh, these are primary uh, feelings, like primary colors. There are a million hues of feelings, but they're made up of these. Now, Bob, take a look at the paper. What are you feeling as you're sitting on that couch right now? And Bob goes, uh, and I say, it can be very slight, but what are you feeling? Bob goes, uh, well, uh, uh, I don't want to fuck this up. I go, yeah, that's fear, Bob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid of fucking it up. I'm a little nervous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where's that nervousness in your body, Bob? It's in my chest. What's the sensation? What's the physical sensation? Kind of fluttery butterflies. Yeah, that sounds like fear. If those, if those butterflies could speak, what would they be saying right now? Uh, I don't want you to judge me. Great, Bob. Huh? And as you say that, do you have any other feelings? Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know why, but when I said that, I, I, I think I got a little sad. Good, Bob. Where's that in you? And we go through the drill. And you know what? Son of a bitch, these guys come up with four, five, six feelings, every single one of them. If you give them the structure and you're patient. Then the punchline, Bob, you're a passionate man. You have this rap of being a stoic, but you're just full of feelings. You know what? And I say this to virtually every guy I work with. Your feelings never left you, my friend. You left them. Mm. They've been percolating this whole time. They're just waiting for you to pay attention to them. All you have to do is turn the satellite in, pay attention, and learn how to speak them. I'll help you. 
so much for unemotional men. I've never met an unemotional man. Mm -hmm. I've been in practice almost 40 years. You know, I was listening to your book, I Don't Want to Talk About It, and you were describing this with um, someone you were working with, and it, it just, like, the like emotion that it brought up just hearing you helping these men connect to their emotions that they were never allowed to connect to is just so incredible. And, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of women listening to this being like, I'm going to go home and do that activity <laughs> with, <laughs> my, with my husband. I am going to write out these core, core emotions. Um, but, I can do it. Uh, gals, uh, I got bad news for you. I can do it better than you can. Yes. Not because I'm a man particularly either of you two could do it but because i'm not married to the son of a gun right. and uh you know that move is a therapeutic move it's not a partner move mm -hmm. uh, but you could try <laughs> do it as a parlor game <laughs> but i think one of the things i also love that you talk about is that you are not neutral as the couples therapist and we were really taught to be that's a big part of your education and it's also i think a reason that people drop out of couples therapy i can't tell you how many women have come in and said we've been to other couples therapists before and it they didn't say anything and they just were neutral and it didn't feel like it there was collaboration or direction right. yeah it didn't do shit right it was a horrible experience and people drop out of couples therapy i think couples therapy is fucking fantastic when it's done right but it can also cause some danger and harm so i'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more towards that of choosing to not be neutral so um uh just yesterday i had a, a couple <clears throat> jewish uh a guy has been uh, dragging his wife to friday night shabbos dinner with his uh, mother and fa family of origin but is led by his mother for 15 years. Uh, uh, wife is a Christian. <laughs> and doesn't particularly like his mother and really would rather not be there. 15 years. Wow. I tell this guy, now she's ready to divorce him. I tell this guy in the very first session, say, uh, do you realize that you've been throwing your wife under the bus for 15 years? How long have you privileged your mother over your wife? And he goes, I don't privilege my mother over. I said, well, uh, you know your wife doesn't want to go to those dinners. Yeah. Uh, what stops you from saying no to your mother? Uh, I, you don't say no to my mother. No, no. You don't say no to your mother. <laughs> what stops you? Uh, I, I, I don't like, uh, I like to avoid conflict. You know, that's really interesting. Uh, because you're sure not avoiding conflict with your wife, are you? Uh, and in one session, this guy says, you're right. And tears come into his eyes. And I say, from this place, tone, turn to this wonderful woman and tell her what's in your heart. And he turns to her and he says, I can't believe what you've been putting up with. Now that's effective couples therapy, one session. But you only get there by telling the truth. The technique for you therapists listening is what I call joining through the truth. And we have a two year training program. It takes, oh, it, this is a sophisticated move. You have to learn how to do it. But joining through the truth is telling the truth, the difficult truth to our clients in a way that is so, first of all, precise and accurate. And secondly, loving and rooting for them. They feel that and they're actually closer to you as a therapist because you've confronted them than they were beforehand. Mm -hmm. You know, we're taught in therapy school, first you build uh, the trusting uh, relationship and then maybe five years down the line, you say, by the way. They've left you by that time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, we, we do it right. You know, it's funny. I, 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 I facetiously said when you pick your nose in public, it's gross. <laughs> I had a guy, the presenting problem is his wife wouldn't have sex with him. And by the way, he had no friends. Mm -hmm. And as he's, he was one of these like entrepreneurial captains of industry, you know, super smart, all head. And as he's telling me how lonely he is and nobody wants to be with him, particularly his wife, 
I wish uh, we're, we're uh, this is just audio, right? You can't see me. I mean, no, we're, we are. We can post the video. Uh, yeah, no, no. Okay, you, yeah, great. we can post the video. Yeah, there's <laughs> okay, video great, too. Yeah. I want you to see this. Yes. This guy's <laughs> rocking, doing that self-stimulation rocking <sighs> thing, you know, that, that MIT, uh, like, uh, 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 you know, and, and he's got a pimple on his nose. He's telling me nobody wants to be with him. He's got a pimple on his nose. And as he's telling me this, feeling horrible about it, He's popping the pimple on yeah, his yeah. nose and little rivulets of blood are like dripping <laughs> down his face. And I say something to this guy that no therapist fresh out of school would say. You know what I say to him? I say to him, Bob. He goes, yeah. I go, what you're doing with your nose right now? He goes, yeah. It's disgusting. <laughs> You're in here because nobody wants to be with you. Right. Let's talk about the ways that you push people away. Mm. Now, wow. if I didn't do that, what the hell would I be talking about? I don't even know what most therapists talk about. It's just bullshit. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that I tell therapists is the thing you say at the water cooler or the coffee pot after the session, I can't believe what a bitch you, I can't believe what an asshole, I can't believe what a spineless that's what you should be saying in the <laughs> session. Those are the issues. It's, uh -huh. it's I'm so the best way to say that. It's so true. And you know, I think that in this field, developing that confidence to trust your own intuition and know that like I am seeing, you know, kind of what's happening here and to be able to separate out your own stuff to make sure there's nothing for you that's coming up that you're bringing in. But that that, you know, takes time and training to really say like, OK, I can trust that this is true um, and then I can call it out. Well, and I think so many therapists are fearful. Yeah. We're sc freaking scared to upset people. <laughs> let, let me say. Uh, you come into RLT training and you get over that issue after about three weeks. <laughs> and let me tell you why. There's two pieces to it. There's trusting yourself to speak it skillfully. But the first order is trust the feelings that you're having to begin with. And here's what I want to say to all the therapists listening. Unless somebody walks in the door with a placard around their neck saying, I remind you of your mother, which you will know, you'll feel it. You'll know when a patient is triggering you, you'll feel it. You'll know when you're off. Unless you're there, trust what you're feeling. What you're feeling on the receiving end of this person is probably what everybody else feels on the receiving end of this person. Whether you choose to use it or store it, trust what you're feeling. It's probably a result of the way this person is having a relationship. Mm, yes. Okay, I have a question for you. Not a question. Let's have a conversation. <laughs> You brought up something really important about, uh, you know, woman on the edge of divorce. Let's talk about how much women are initiating divorce. Because I think as young women, we were told a, a, a myth, a lie. Oh, your husband could leave you, right? Like for a lot of women, this became this like anxious thing of like, I got to keep him happy. He's going to leave me. Right, which kept but, women from confronting their husbands. Yes, exactly. Right. But the reality is, is women initiate divorce at a drastically higher rate than men do. 75%. <laughs> people don't know that information like, i mean that's a ridiculous percentage women initiate divorce uh because the, the absence of fierce intimacy they put up with 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 and then the guy leaves the jar off the mayonnaise and that's it we're getting a divorce <laughs> and what's really going on is 30 years of resentment and mm -hmm. disempowerment uh, but yes, women in record number are getting a divorce. Women, here, here's the conundrum. <clears throat> Across the West, to go back to the first part of our conversation, women want more emotional intimacy from men than in our culture we raise boys and men to deliver. You read the literature, Judy Chu, little boys stop show an, a, a, a remarkable, you know, a measurable, statistically significant decrease in expressing emotion. They still have them, but they know better than to express them. Mm -hmm. You know what age? Well, you do because you're therapist. Three, <laughs> four, five. Oh. 
It's like heartbreaking. It's that's so sad. It's really sad. Yeah. It's really sad. Now, one of the, since we're talking about men, this is this is a good one. Uh, I talk to a lot of men about the difference between gratification and relational joy. Mm. And many of the men that I work with have no idea what relational joy even means. Gratification is a short-term hit of pleasure. You do well at your job. You, uh, a pretty girl smiles at you. You have a martini. It's fine in its place. Relational joy is a deeper down pleasure that comes from just being together. It's not about doing, it's about being. And it's just about the joy. You know, the example I give is parenting. You guys are a little young. I don't know if you have kids or not. But I, 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 I do. <laughs> All right. So my little Alexander, who's now get, get, getting both an MD and a PhD. <laughs> That's a little, little <laughs> Yeah, right. He was a pistol. And I, he did something, and I'm giving a timeout. I'm holding the door shut. We didn't have locks. I'm holding the door shut, and he's trying to get it open. He's like this big. And I'm telling you, man, clouds were forming. Light was coming. <laughs> and the whole house was shaking. <laughs> Part of me wanted to throw him through the goddamn window. I was so mad at him. <laughs> And a deeper part of me just loved him to death. What mm -hmm. a mighty little spirit you have. Now that's relational joy. Sometimes the person you're with is gratifying. Sometimes they're a major pain in the ass. None of that matters. Mm. Being there is what matters for the good times and bad. And I'll say to a guy, do you know what I'm talking about? And I can't tell you how many men say no. I don't. I had a guy just the other week. He was worth, well, I deal with high rollers, so he was an <laughs> uber high roller. You know, brought three companies public by the time he had 40. Mm -hmm. And um, he was only, mis he had a beautiful wife. He had two kids. He had more money than God. He was well-respected, blah, blah, blah. He, he was missing one thing, joy. Mm -hmm. He had no joy in his life. He was dead. So I talked to him about gratification. I said, you've lived your whole life for gratification. What you're missing is relational joy. Mm -hmm. I said, have you ever in your life had a moment of that feeling? And he says, you know, I do. I feel it mm -hmm. when I play with my little kids. Mm -hmm. I said, how's that feel? He said, it feels like the best part of my life. I said, it is. He came back two weeks later and I said, how are you? And he said, I'm a different person. And I said, why? And he said, I've just been walking around for the last two weeks going, hmm, where's my relational joy here? Hmm, what do I have to do? And I've been so different with my wife, and she mm. knows it. Two sessions. You know, as you talk about that, what was coming up for me is that you know, men are, are, you know, so often taught that, like, you find joy in success and um, wealth and, you know, so often finding out that that's not true. Um, well, it's true to a degree. Right. <laughs> it just doesn't solve all your problems for mm -hmm. you. Right. And so as, you know, I don't even know if this fully touches on it, but as do you see any difference or um, any challenges in a marriage in which like a, a woman is the breadwinner and how that plays out with intimacy in the relationship? Yeah, there's studies about this. The more uh, money the woman, <laughs> okay, your tax dollars at work. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> Very sophisticated studies. You know what the results are? <laughs> the more money a woman makes, the less shit she's willing to put up with. <laughs> so true it's we're not talking about from our personal experience no. or anything we're not just this hypothetical not at all talking about what it's been like for us to be the breadwinners in our marriages and what that brings up for our husbands well, that becomes say, difficult yeah say a word about that so I think for both of us it's brought up one for us to feel like a huge power differential and then the thing is that we can also transfer into like taking on the masculine grandiose role also with weak boundaries though and this other part of then i think for for both of us who have husbands who 
their careers were part of worth that job career success was a big part of worth and that has been a bit of the um <laughs> existential crisis for them <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well the existential crisis is uh it, 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 there may be more to you than your career and th- that is shocking news for a lot of guys a lot of guys are truly workaholic in the sense that they filter their sense of self-esteem through their performance at work. Good day at work, they're worthwhile. Bad day at work, they're pieces of shit. This is what we call performance-based esteem. And it's very big for men. Uh, there are three, four, healthy self-esteem comes from the inside out. This is what I would be saying to your two husbands. Healthy self-esteem is unconditional, just the way you love a child. I have worth because I'm here and I'm breathing. It can't be added to, can't be subtracted from. It's an existential fact. My worth is no better or worse than the guy to the left or the right of me. It cannot be. That guy may be a better businessman. That guy may be a better tennis player. That guy may even be a better lover, but he's not a better human being. In the book I'm writing now, I call this the great lie. The lie that our culture rests upon, the core of our culture is the lie of superiority and inferiority. Mm -hmm. And uh, my work is about coming out from underneath that lie. We are of equal value. I'm making more money than you are. Ain't that great? Let's go have a pizza. (laughs) As simple as that. (laughs) As simple as that. Well, and it is, it's like, you know, I love, we talk about relational mindfulness. I also love that it's us, right? That we're not two, like we are two individuals, of course, but like, what is a marriage? What is us together? Yeah, well, that's the whole point of the, of my new uh, work, which is, I go through the biology of this. When we don't Mm -hmm. feel safe, we go back to what part of you am I talking to? When we don't feel safe, we lo- the prefrontal cortex shuts down. We move to more primitive parts of the brain. And in those primitive parts of the brain, it's about you and me, win, lose, adversary. One of us gets it, the other one doesn't. That, that, that is not reality. That, that is an immature way of thinking about mm-hmm. things. And it's only the adult part of us that can see the whole, that even gets that this is a relationship. Mm. And uh, that goes back to relational mindfulness. When you lose that and it's dukes up, uh, take a breath, take a break, splash some water on your face and get those dukes back down again. You know, for example, Uh, The relational answer to the question, who's right and who's wrong, is who cares? Mm -hmm. The real question is, how are the two of us going to make this work? And uh, uh, the whole new book is about shifting from that kind of individualistic thinking to simply thinking like a team, thinking like a whole. I call it applying ecological wisdom to your relationship. Mm. And I, in the book, I critique two things. I critique patriarchy and individualism, mm. the culture of individualism. And individualism teaches us that we are apart from nature. And patriarchy teaches us that we're in control of nature. Mm. And they're both delusions. You are not apart from your own marriage, dumb cuff. You're in it. <laughs> I like to say our relationships You'll hear this again when I come back. Our relationships are like our biosphere. We breathe it. We're in it. We're not somewhere out there. And and when you realize that you're in the relationship, that it's the context that you depend upon, that you you take better care of it. Mm. You know, you can choose to pollute your biosphere over here with your anger, uh, but you'll breathe in that pollution over here with your partner's withdrawal. You're connected. It's inevitable. You know, for example, I say, if one of you wins and the other one loses, you both lose. But do you know why? Do you know why? Because it comes back around. (laughs) That's exactly right. The loser will make the winner pay for it. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And so, so I know we, you know, we talked about men and kind of how that plays out. And I, I know you mentioned that, you know, women will start building this resentment. Can you tell us, talk, speak a little bit to that and like how that plays out in the relationship, how you see that coming out within communication? Well, the first casualty uh, when women stop telling the truth uh, to men is uh, sex, it's passion. That's the first casualty. Uh, resentment and passion don't go together. And resentment and generosity don't go together, particularly sexual generosity. Mm -hmm. And so the first place this shows up is the bedroom, but it's not the only place. And there are exceptions to that, but by and large. Uh, this not, and, and women are taught to tell themselves, well, no, I'm just compromising, you know, I'm just, yeah, no. Uh -uh. Compromise on your car, compromise on <laughs> your school. Don't compromise on the relationship you live in, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the rest of your life. Fight for what you really want, mm -hmm. but fight for it skillfully. Oh my God, we're obsessed with you. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. Um, I'm, not, I'm just sitting here with my mind. I forget that we're even on a podcast. Uh, yeah, this is the podcast. This is, this is for us now. Um, okay. Hey, can I, can I put in a plug speaking about the uh, fight skillfully? Please. Wait, wait, wait. As we speak, there is an online course, uh, five classes called Staying in Love. <sighs> and I'd like to, it's not incredibly expensive and it uh, it's full of skills. And I'd like to invite all of your viewers and listeners to go to terryreal.com just by name t-e-r-r-y-r-e-a-l and uh and sign up and uh take it with your partner mm. and talk about it stay in love and stay you in love. and you can text your email address also right to 415-813-1025-1025 and if you just text your email address you could opt in text to get more information and get more information. information and uh you you may be too young for this but uh there's a legendary uh feminist psychologist carol gilligan and uh if you uh, give me your email we'll send you an interview that carol and i did with each other in which she talks from her perspective about what's unique about the work that I'm doing. Oh, yes. And all of this can be found in our show notes for today's episode. So if you're listening to this while you're driving, you're thinking, oh, shit, I'm missing it. It is in all of the show notes and it'll put on all of our social media, Instagram, Facebook, everything for you guys to have. Let's end here today because you're coming back because we can, we are so, Please. so excited for your next book. <laughs> I want to know what is your best advice for a couple who's about to get married? Okay. When faced with an upset partner, almost all of us have two places that we go, two references, two orientations. The first place we go is to objective reality. I'm listening to Emily and I'm going, yeah, well, that's right. That's not right. That's half right. That's a quarter right. Yeah, I did that, but you have to understand that. And, whether we're too smart to say it out loud, what we're doing in our heads is rebutting. We're not listening, we're rebutting. Mm. Because we're measuring everything our partner says against objective reality. Mm. Okay, give that up. The second orientation we generally go to is ourselves. I can't believe what a pain in the ass this is to have to sit here and listen to it. Let go of that. Replace objective reality and replace your own selfish concerns with this. Grab a pencil if you have one and write this phrase down. Compassionate curiosity about your partner's subjective experience. It's got nothing to do with reality. Mm. Compassionate curiosity about your partner's subjective experience. Jen, I'm sorry you feel bad, hon. I love you. I don't want you to feel bad. Tell me what's going on and uh, let me know if there's something I could do to help you feel better. Terry, I feel so 
validated already and I wasn't even saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Before we end for today with all of our amazing guests, we do calling bullshit. And I know that, a, that you sent one over, but I'll give you an opportunity. What is something you want to call bullshit on? A lot of people, men in particular, have pushed back uh, as I challenge patriarchy. And they're uh, saying to one another on Twitter uh, that uh, I am interested in feminizing men. You know what? I call bullshit on that. <laughs> I'm not interested in feminizing men any more than I'm interested in masculinizing women. Mm. I'm interested in whole human beings who can be strong and vulnerable, smart and sexy on both sides, the whole thing. That's our birthright. Mm. Let's be whole together. Terry Real, life changing, <laughs> life changing, every person. <laughs> Where can people find you? So they can opt in with that text. They can join um, all of your amazing stuff. But also, where can people find you? Terry, just my name, T-E-R-R-Y. That's T like Thomas. Everybody calls me Jerry. <laughs> Terryreal.com, T-E-R-R-Y-R-E-A-L.com. And it's all there on the website. Amazing. Thank you. We for cannot being thank here you today. enough for being here. We really appreciate it. If this episode resonated with you um or if it, if you think it'll resonate with a friend feel free to send it over you can always rate review subscribe and on apple it's follow thank you so much for joining in today and remember in order to grow yourself you got to know yourself <laughs>